Section 4 of The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 4. Edited by Francis Rault Wheeler. Chemistry, Chapter 4, The Later Alchemists. Until lately, the marked progress in chemical knowledge, which occurred toward the end of the 15th century and at the beginning of the 16th century, was always associated with the name of Bacillus Valentinus. But the authenticity of the writings ascribed to him has become more and more questioned, and they are evidently spurious in parts. He seems to have been born at Mayence about 1394, and to have been a monk of the Benedictine order, but although numerous works have been printed in his name, no further particulars concerning his life have descended to posterity. The important works which appear under his name are as follows. Curus Triumphalis Antimonii, De Microcosmo, De Que Magno Mundi Mysterio et Medicina Hominis, Tractatus Chemico, Philosophicus, De Rebus Naturalibus, et Praeter Naturalibus, Metallorum et mineralium. Practica, una cum duo decim, clavibus et appendici. De magno lapide antiquorum sapientum, and testamentum ultimum. It is impossible to extract from these works the knowledge gained and possessed by the original author, but as von Mayer states, there can hardly be any doubt that a large number of facts were recorded by the writer who lived about a hundred years before the books were published, this being especially the case in the triumphal car of antimony, in which we possess what for a time was a marvelous description of an element and its compounds. In this work the extraction of antimony from the sulfide found in nature is described and the properties of antimony are in part mentioned. Antimony was used in purifying gold, and its compounds were applied medicinally. It would appear that Basil Valentine was the first to prepare hydrochloric acid by heating together copperas and common salt, and that he was acquainted with the rectification of the distillate obtained from beer and wine by means of potassium carbonate, the use of precipitation as a method of experimenting, and the employment of the spirit lamp in certain operations. Judging from some passages in the works ascribed to him, Basil Valentine made the first attempts at qualitative analysis, for he proved that iron was present in certain hard tins, gold in Hungarian silver, silver in Mansfield copper, and copper in Hungarian iron. The language used in the works of Valentine is frequently obscured by mystical pictures and ideas, and, like others of his time, he often found it impossible to express his alchemistic thought in any language save that of far-fetched allegory. The 16th century, a period of reformation, adventure, and discovery, is characterized by the Paracelsus, who formed the transition from the alchemists of the Arabic school to the iatro chemists. The latter had other objects of research than the alchemists, but as some of the Paracelsists and medical mystics were hermetic philosophers. It is appropriate to refer to their alchemistic views here. Paracelsus, the Luther of medicine, the seer of Hohenheim, created a new school of alchemy. He considered that gold could be made by application of chemistry, but that the process is not to be compared with the method of producing gold by an exercise of the occult powers existing in the soul of man. On adopting this view, Paracelsus, with alchemistic tendencies, abandoned experimental investigation and sought within themselves the great secret of alchemy. Libavius, who criticized the mystical writings of Paracelsus, nevertheless fully believed in the transmutation of the metals, and even Van Helmont, the most distinguished of the iatro chemists, went so far as to testify that he himself had effected the transmutation of mercury into gold. In his work, De Vita Eterna, according to Waite, Van Helmont makes the following declaration. I have seen and I have touched the philosopher's stone more than once, 
the color of it was like saffron in powder but heavy and shining like pounded glass i had once given me the fourth part of a grain i call a grain that which takes six hundred to make an ounce i made projection therewith wrapped in paper upon eight ounces of quicksilver heated in a crucible and immediately all the quicksilver having made a little noise stopped and congealed into a yellow mass having melted it in a strong fire i found within eleven grains of eight ounces of the most pure gold so that a grain of this powder would have transmuted into a very good gold nineteen thousand one hundred and fifty six grains of quicksilver he states further that he performed a similar operation in public many times and consequently believed in the certainty of the art although he did not possess the secret of making the transmuting agent other chemists of the sixteenth century as agricola and senert were not avowed alchemists yet they did not oppose views respecting the transmutation of metals the last important iatro chemist Tecanius, alone contended against the ennobling of metals his instructor in leyden franz de la beau accepted the belief of his times in regard to transmutation in the reign of james i of england reports were circulated that an artist butler had performed several transmutations in london by means of a red powder secured from an arabian alchemist and later he is said to have accomplished wonderful cures with a hermetic medicine van helmont attests these miracles some of which he had the opportunity of witnessing after chemistry had assumed its proper position as a science in the phlogistic period and its study was neither obscured by attempts at transmutation nor limited to the preparation of medicines many experimenters still remain convinced of the possibility of converting individual metals into another although alchemical work was kept secret to a great extent and was looked down upon yet expressions of belief were far from being uncommon even among such chemists as robert boyle johann kunkel hamburg george stahl and hermann borjava in his old age however stahl advised and warned against the pursuit of alchemy and borjava after considerable experimental work showed the falsity of many of the views held by the alchemists for example the alchemists asserted that quicksilver could be fixed in a fireproof metallic condition without the addition of any other substance but borjava disproved this by keeping quicksilver at a somewhat raised temperature in an open vessel for fifteen years without noting any change and when he heated the quicksilver at a higher temperature in a closed vessel for six months no change was observed ernst von meyer states in his history of chemistry that after his that is borjava's time no notable exponent of chemistry which had now attained to the rank of a science spoke in support of the alchemistic views but all the greater was the number of cheats and swindlers who cultivated the lucrative field of gold-making even during the eighteenth century the conviction of the impossibility of transmutation which was at that time establishing itself among scientific chemists made its way but slowly into outer circles credulity and the hope of obtaining riches for nothing were the means of leading many into very doubtful paths even so late as the end of the eighteenth century and the beginning of the nineteenth final echoes of the alchemistic problem which had for so long a period of time held the cultured of every nation in a state of tension and had even blinded eminent scientific men only appear to have died away during the last decades of the nineteenth century the statements of witnesses and conductors of alleged transmutations are often impressive and convincing and such testimony is the strongest of the supposed evidence in favor of gold making probably the most interesting of such records is that contained in the golden calf the world's idol of john frederick helvetius an eminent dutch physician written in 1667 in his work helvetius narrates the fact that he received from the artist elias a piece of the philosopher's stone the latter had in his possession and that this piece no larger than a grain of rapeseed transmuted six drams of lead into the finest gold this gold was then taken to a silversmith who first mixed four parts of silver with one part of the gold then he filed it 
put aqua fortis to it, dissolve the silver, and let the gold precipitate to the bottom. The solution being poured off and the calyx of gold washed with water, then reduced and melted, it appeared excellent gold, and instead of a loss in weight, we found the gold was increased, and had transmuted a scruple of the silver into gold by its abounding tincture. In the seventeenth century, it appeared impossible to doubt such testimony, and at that time, it was not known that the articles made from alchemistic gold were but worthless alloys, prepared for fraudulent purposes. Among the other hermetic philosophers and adepts of the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries may be mentioned Jean Despanet, author of a treatise on mystical alchemy, Alexander Sethan, who suffered from exposure of his power, Michael Sendivogius, who made gold by projection in the presence of Emperor Rudolf II at Prague and at Varsovia and Württemberg, Boussardier, who left a powder when he died, one grain of which was used by Emperor Ferdinand III for converting three pounds of mercury into gold, Irenaeus Philolethes, Pierre Fabre, John Oberreit, Lascarius, who is recorded as having changed mercury into gold and gold into silver, and Delisle. Alchemistic efforts were especially encouraged during this period at the courts of a large number of German princes, many of whom were amateur alchemists themselves, and who expended large sums of money in fostering gold-making. The priests of trickery were, however, finally exposed as frauds and rogues, and a dire punishment was meted out to them, almost without exception. It has been mentioned that the alchemistic ideas, with the transmutation of metals as their leading tenet, originated in Egypt, where they were first fostered by the initiates of the sacred art, and that the conversion of the sacred art of Egypt into alchemy resulted from contact with European thought and ecclesiastical mysticism. The Egyptian priests, taught the unity of nature, and asserted that a fundamental similarity existed between heavenly and terrestrial things. But alchemy, while its argument rested on a supposed familiarity with nature's methods, and postulated an orderly and simple universe, applied moral conceptions to material phenomena, and pursued a policy, rich in fantastic detail, dictated by fanciful conceptions. The original and central aim of alchemy was the production of a substance which was variously designated as the philosopher's stone, the one thing, the essence, the great elixir, the great magisterium, the red tincture, the stone of wisdom, the heavenly balm, the divine water, the virgin water, the phoenix, the lion, the old dragon, the basilisk, and the carbuncle of the sun. This substance was supposed to have the power of transmuting base metals into gold, but other powers were attributed to it also, and the alchemists undoubtedly regarded it as the soul of all things. After the 8th century, the philosopher's stone was reputed to possess the power of curing all diseases and was styled the great panacea. This belief in its powers came into existence gradually, owing to the western alchemists attaching too literal an interpretation to some of the Arabian descriptions of its powers. For instance, Gerber termed the base metals invalids, which he would cure, or transmute, by means of the philosopher's stone. At a much later date, about 1600, it was claimed that the philosopher's stone could transform quartz into gems, change a thousand pearls into one pearl of great beauty, and render glass malleable. It was also said to possess the power of imparting moral culture and redemption from sin. The descriptions of the one thing differ widely, and the alchemists could describe it only in contraries. Some spoke of it as a red powder, others stated that it possessed a peach blow color, and many affirmed that it was of a gray appearance. Paracelsus described it as a very stable red substance, transparent as crystal, pliable as gum, and yet as fragile as glass. When pulverized, it was said to resemble saffron. Philolethes states, in his Brief Guide to the Celestial Ruby, The philosopher's stone is a certain heavenly, spiritual, penetrative, and fixed substance, 
which brings all metals to the perfection of gold or silver according to the quality of the medicine and that by natural methods which yet in their effects transcend nature know then that it is called a stone not because it is like a stone but only because by virtue of its fixed nature it resists the action of fire as successfully as any stone in species it is gold more pure than the purest it is fixed and incombustible like a stone but its appearance is that of a very fine powder impalpable to the touch sweet to the taste fragrant to the smell in potency a most penetrative spirit apparently dry and yet unctuous and easily capable of tinging a plate of metal the processes given for preparing the great magisterium are also numerous and varied the methods whereby the agent is itself perfected and the processes wherein the agent effects the perfecting of the base and unperfect things were divided into ten or twelve gates or stages by the alchemists the prime requisite was the securing of the crude material to be employed this was called the materia prima cruda terra virginiae etc and although it was thought to occur in very large amounts its identity was unknown and the procuring of this substance was considered to be the really difficult part of the undertaking from the materia prima cruda was to be obtained the materia prima matura a substance also known as the mercurius philosophorum or azoth to which was then to be added aro philosophorum this mixture was then digested at a low heat for some time without the presence of the air in the ovum philosophicum to procure the raven's head or the caput corvi a black substance which through long digestion becomes transformed into the swan a white body the latter was then exposed to a higher temperature to produce the philosopher's stone the various gates were known as calcination dissolution conjunction putrefaction congelation citation sublimation fermentation and exaltation the alexandrians believed that the metals were alloys of varying composition and consequently that the transformation of one metal into another was possible either by means of the addition of other substances or the expulsion of some present and the western alchemists regarded all metals as compounds for example arnaldus villanovanus and remundus lullius assumed mercury and sulphur as their constituents and the latter asserted that every substance is composed of these two substances under the term mercurius or mercury the alchemists saw the cause of metallic glance and malleability while the term sulphur was used to express the idea of transmutability and also combustibility and the various metals were regarded as compounds of these substances in different proportions for instance gold the most perfect metal which nature was thought to form slowly in the earth was considered to be a compound of much mercury with only a small amount of sulphur therefore considering that all other metals differed from gold only in the proportions in which mercury and sulphur were present the alchemists sought for an agent whereby these proportions could be changed and gold produced introspection preceding observation gave rise to the alchemistic views of the universe and natural phenomena and to quote m m pattison muir the change from alchemy to chemistry is an admirable example of the change from a theory formed by looking inward and then projected onto external facts to a theory formed by studying facts and then thinking about them although many of the theories of the alchemists were ridiculous and much unimportant material was accumulated by them yet they untiringly pursued their quest their views were connected with their practice and as muir observes there was a constant action and reaction between their general scheme of things and many branches of what we now call chemical manufactures the result of this was that some progress worthy of account was made in the knowledge of applied chemistry during the alchemistic period metallurgy was not the least of these three new metals antimony bismuth and zinc were discovered in the second half of the age of alchemy and the knowledge of the properties of the metals already known was increased 
but few alterations were made in the methods of extracting and purifying metals as might be expected the greatest importance was attached to the treatment of gold and silver ores and quite accurate balances came to be used as a result of the attention given to the yield of the noble metals for a long time gold was obtained in a pure condition just as it was in earlier times that is by the use of lead but later it was ascertained that it could be purified by fusion with stibnite antimony trisulfide and in the time of albertus magnus it was found that gold and silver could be separated by treatment with nitric acid prior to this time the cementation process of the ancients was employed for effecting the separation of the noble metals silver was extracted by fusion with lead a method in use in pliny's time mercury was obtained by roasting its ores in furnaces and by distilling sublimate mercuric chloride mixed with caustic lime it was used in extracting the noble metals in gilding and in alchemical research zinc and bismuth are mentioned in alchemical literature and it would appear that zinc was used in the early medieval times however these metals were not used technically cobalt ore is also sometimes mentioned in the fifteenth century copper was prepared by immersing plates of iron in solutions of bluestone copper sulfate but there are no important improvements to record in the methods of extracting and preparing iron lead and tin however the various degrees of hardness and softness of iron were known at an early period and the deportment of copper iron lead and tin when subjected to heat and to the action of acids was studied throughout the alchemistic period ceramics advanced to no little degree in ancient times glass had been colored by adding various oxides of metals to the fused mass but in this age it was learned that the colors could be burned in a decidedly important discovery it was also found that the use of glazes containing lead and tin for earthenware vessels was advantageous for certain purposes dyeing became better understood several important dyes were introduced during the alchemistic period orchilla which was known in ancient rome was brought from the east about the thirteenth century and conchineal was introduced by the arabians indigo also began to be used during this period alum was employed almost entirely as the mordant in dyeing inorganic compounds were more thoroughly studied nitric and sulfuric acids were obtained at an early date the former was first prepared by the distillation of a mixture of saltpetre bluestone and alum but later it was found that it could be produced from saltpetre and sulfuric acid and sulfuric acid was prepared by distilling a mixture of iron vitriol and pebbles and by burning sulphur after the addition of saltpetre under a hood fitted with a side tube for the overflow of the acid produced when sulphur is burned alone a gas now known as sulphur dioxide is produced and it is known that the water solution of this gas was often confounded with sulphuric acid gerber prepared sulphuric acid by heating alum but failed to study its properties other than finding that it was a powerful solvent at a much later date hydrochloric acid was produced by heating common salt and green vitriol this acid which was known as spiritus solis was mixed with nitric acid to prepare aqua regia a strong solvent which the alchemists thought closely approximated the alkahest or universal solvent the alchemists were acquainted with a large number of salts of which it was thought that solubility in water was a general characteristic hence the term sol included a large number of substances and was widely distorted the term alkali was first mentioned in the latin writings ascribed to gerber but according to von meyer one seldom meets in the alchemistic age with a strict distinction between potash and soda or between their carbonates while on the other hand preparations of carbonate of potash obtained in different ways were regarded as dissimilar products the distinction drawn by abu mansur between nantrum for example the soda found in nature as a mineral deposit and qualia the alkali from the ashes of land plants is however very noteworthy 
these names were perpetuated in the german words natron and cali the solvent power of the lyes obtained from the carbonates of potash and soda by the addition of lime was made use of by the alchemists among the salts known to the alchemists were alum which was prepared from alum shale and widely used iron and copper vitriols saltpetre salmiac and carbonate of ammonia saltpetre potassium nitrate was probably used in early times in the manufacture of fireworks it was known in various periods of this age as sal petrosum sal nitri and nitrum salmiac sal ammoniacum chloride of ammonia was originally prepared from dung although some of the naturally occurring product of volcanic origin was used carbonate of ammonia was prepared by the chemists of the thirteenth century and was known to them as spiritus urinae later it was obtained from salmiac and alkali carbonate other inorganic compounds known to the alchemists were nitrate of silver chloride of silver mercuric oxide mercuric chloride basic mercuric sulfate mercuric nitrate zinc oxide zinc sulfate antimony trichloride basic chloride of antimony antimony trioxide potassium antimoniate arsenious acid peroxide of iron oxide of copper and the lead oxides as before mentioned the alchemists knew that gold dissolved in aqua regia this solution aurum potabile was thought to possess wonderful medicinal effects they also knew that silver could be precipitated from a silver nitrate solution by the use of mercury or copper the preparation of antimony from the sulphide by fusion with iron is described in several of the works ascribed to basil valentine it is mentioned in these works that antimony does not possess the properties of a metal in full degree and that it is a variety of lead in the fifteenth century antimony was used in certain alloys and the compounds of it then known were used in medicine arsenic was prepared in the thirteenth century by the western alchemists who considered that it was a bastard metal arsenious acid was prepared as early as the tenth century by roasting realgar and was called white arsenic at a much later period about the close of the medieval age it was observed that arsenious acid occurs in the fumes from pyrites furnaces mention has been made of some sulphur compounds the sulphides of mercury cinnabar and antimony stibnite among others which were found to be valuable materials for the production of sulphur and other bodies these were grouped together as forming a particular variety of compounds under the name of marcasite albertus magnus zinc blende galena lead sulphide and iron and copper pyrites being included among them the peculiarity which these substances had in common that of giving off a product of such characteristic odor as sulfurous acid when roasted may have formed the main reason for assigning them to one group it should be remembered however that the production of several metallic sulfides from their components had been observed for example the formation of cinnabar from quicksilver and sulphur and this may be supposed to have contributed materially to a knowledge of their composition realgar and orpiment were known to the arabian physicians the alchemists were fond of using the names of animals as symbols of certain mineral substances and of representing operations in the laboratory by what may be called animal allegories the yellow lion was the alchemical symbol of yellow sulphides the red lion was synonymous with cinnabar and the green lion meant salts of iron and of copper black sulphides were called eagles and sometimes crows when black sulphide of mercury is strongly heated a red sublimate is obtained which has the same composition as the black compound if the temperature is not kept very high little of the red sulphide is produced the alchemist directed to urge the fire else the black crows will go back to the nest organic compounds were also examined and their properties recorded notwithstanding the fact that the alchemists originally paid more attention to the properties of mineral bodies rather than to those of organic bodies 
yet the study of the action of heat upon bodies when air is excluded and improvements in methods of distillation led to the investigation in a crude manner of the products of distillation and eventually to the discovery of definite organic compounds among the few organic preparations known to the alchemists spirit of wine takes a prominent place this compound was formerly designated by very different names for instance marcus gracchus eighth century calls it aqua ardens the latin translators of gerber's works refer to it as aqua vitae and others mention it as aqua vitis mercurius vegetabilis spiritus vivus and consolatio ultima corporis humani the term spiritus vini first occurs in the writings ascribed to basil valentine and the name alcohol was first used by libavius at the end of the sixteenth century the symbols used to denote the metals have been referred to among other signs employed instead of writing the names of substances were the following sulphur triangle with an upside down cross on the bottom vitriol a circle with a cross in it fire triangle air with an a water with an upside down triangle water with two wavy lines earth with an upside down triangle with a line on the bottom aqua fortis upside down triangle with two lines on the sides aqua regia a v with a curved line on the side aqua vitae a v with three circles on the points de a circle with an angled line on the top night a circle with an angled line on the bottom amalgam an upside down v with three lines crossing it alembic an upside down v and a right side up v the alexandrians employed two vessels in conducting a distillation one for evaporating the liquid and the other for condensing the vapor and this improvement resulted in the simplification of the method of manufacturing spirit of wine and an extension of its importance in medicine and alchemy the preparation of concentrated spirit of wine by repeated distillation and by rectification over dry carbonate of potash was described by raymundus lullius who also examined the action of sulphuric acid upon spirit of wine spirits were generally dehydrated by rectifying at a low temperature however in order to condense the vapors completely they were passed through long condensing tubes often of an extraordinary form at the close of the middle ages the alchemists were acquainted with several ethers which they prepared in an impure state by the action of acids on spirit of wine one of the alchemical writers speaks of a spirit prepared in this way which has a subtle penetrating pleasant taste and an agreeable smell this probably referred to ethyl oxide or ethyl ether a compound prepared by various chemists in the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries it has been mentioned that the only acid with which the ancients were acquainted was vinegar that is an impure wine vinegar the alchemists however learned to concentrate vinegar and it is to them that is owed the first production of acetic acid by distillation the alchemical views concerning the formation of acetic acid from alcohol are vague and it was frequently confounded with the acids observed in plant juices the belief in the transmutability of metals was dismissed from chemistry when lavoisier established the important generalization of the new chemistry namely that matter may be changed but neither destroyed nor created seventeen seventy nevertheless many have applied themselves to attempts at converting the bountiful metals into the agreed standard of exchange but these experimenters have been for the most part men of limited chemical knowledge and experience and to quote charles baskerville a careful analysis of the motives actuating and methods pursued presents merely an inferior picture of the perfected practices we are gradually learning of as obtaining in that circle termed high finance the alchemical literature of the nineteenth century is quite extensive but is in general cabalistic and teeming with credulity misconception and misinformation 
at the present time there is a strong inclination among chemists toward a belief in the mutual convertibility of chemically similar elements this view is based on the supposition that all the chemical elements are combinations of different quantities of one primal element and on the peculiar conduct of certain recently discovered elements in fact the belief in the transmutation of atoms is in close agreement with the present theories of atomic disintegration but this is based on new discoveries and on correctly interpreted chemical problems and not upon false deduction and experiment it is therefore not to be confused with the earlier views for even if the hypothetical primal element should be isolated one aim of alchemy would be fulfilled but the fulfillment would not be that whereof the alchemistical philosophers taught and dreamed end of section four section five of the science history of the universe volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by lawrence trask mount vernon ohio interfaceaudio.com the science history of the universe volume four edited by francis rolt wheeler chemistry chapter five the iatro chemical period part one up to this time traditional belief had dominated every branch of science and scientific inquiry had been pursued almost solely in the cloister but now the great universities of oxford heidelberg and others in france and italy were beginning to make their influence felt and the sciences found a foothold in these institutions then too these seats of learning favored the free exchange of thought and the introduction of the art of printing resulted in the quick and wide dissemination of ideas consequently the capacity for reflection and criticism spread and the boundaries of human knowledge were enlarged a further aid to the development of the natural sciences was supplied by certain modern eclectic philosophers who perceived the defects and errors of ancient lore and philosophy and burst the enclosure of authority by attempting innovations in philosophy the inductive method was found to be of especial value in combating and controverting medieval belief and by its means the experimental sciences came into existence it was believed that chemistry should serve the interests of medicine and therefore there was a strong tendency toward a concatenation of the two medicine was to a certain extent regarded as a division of applied chemistry and then it began to be viewed as the true end of chemistry the chemist was to discover prepare and investigate medicines duties which resulted in the carrying out of many careful researches and in the discovery of new compounds while the physician was to study their action on the human economy this fusion resulted in the birth of organic chemistry and the application of men belonging to a learned profession to the problems offered by chemical phenomena enriched both medicine and chemistry this increase in knowledge gradually led to definite ideas and the iatro chemical period thus formed a period of extension for chemistry in the first half of the sixteenth century a suebian physician philippus aurelius paracelsus theophrastus bombastus von hohenheim better known as paracelsus a name which has always carried with it a mysterious suggestion of power liberated chemistry from the yoke of alchemy and joined it with medicine he accomplished this during a period of ecclesiastical and national reformation when luther and calvin were combating against superstition when copernicus was remodeling astronomy and the changes he wrought through his originality of thought and teaching and freedom and vigor of expression well entitled him to the appellation some have seen fit to give him the luther of medicine Paracelsus was born at Einsiedeln, Switzerland, on November 10, 1493. His father was a physician, 
and Paracelsus received his first introduction in medicine from him, and at the age of sixteen he entered the University of Basel, where he studied for a short time. So desirous was he of penetrating into the mysteries of nature, however, that he neglected books and took prolonged journeys through most of the known countries of the world, where he had many romantic and hazardous experiences, but nevertheless sought to glean every scrap of knowledge obtainable from literary and learned men, mechanics, metallurgical workers, occults, and everyone with whom he came in contact. He returned to Switzerland about 1525, and was recommended by Osiolampadius to the chair of physics at Basel. He commenced his career at this institution by publicly burning the works of Avicenna and Galen, and at once began his fight against the old medical school. He was forced to leave Basel, however, in 1527, after a quarrel with the municipal council, and withdrew into Alsace, whither his fame in medicine followed him. About 1530 he returned to Switzerland, and from this time he seems to have roved restlessly in Germany and Austria, until at last in the year 1541 he died in the hospital of St. Sebastian, in Salzburg in the Tyrol. The character and ability of Paracelsus have been rated high by some, and extolled and abused by others, even his disciples. One writer says of him, he lived like a pig, looked like a drover, found his greatest enjoyment in the company of the most dissolute and lowest rabble, and throughout his glorious life he was generally drunk. It is true that his life offered a strong contrast to his mentality, but he was a man of noble character and intentions, a Christian humanist and ambulatory theosophist, who hoped to inspire mankind with a love of conscientiousness and veracity, and to restore the suffering to health. Paracelsus was active as a teacher, physician, and writer, and over a hundred books have been attributed to him. These works cover many subjects, chemistry, medicine, astrology, botany, etc., but it has lately been shown that much of the subject matter was not really his. The chemical knowledge and medical views of Paracelsus are best seen in the following works, De Tinctura Physicarum, Archidoxa, Peregranum, Paramirum, De Morbis Ex Tartaro Oriundus, and Gros Wonderasnae. Two other of his well-known works are Das Gulden Fluss and Testamentum Theophrasti Paracelsi. An excellent collection of various editions of the works of Paracelsus, together with many commentaries and translations, is now preserved in the Homeopathic Medical College of Philadelphia. Paracelsus taught that the object of chemistry is not to make gold, but to prepare medicines, and he considered that the operations which occur in the human body are chemical ones, and that the state of health is dependent upon the composition of the organs and juices they secrete. Medicine, Paracelsus asserted, rests upon four pillars, chemistry, philosophy, astronomy, and virtue. Organic bodies were composed of mercury, sulfur, and salt, which corresponded to the physical phenomena of volatilization, combustibility, and solidification, but which were related in a higher sense to spirit, soul, and body, and the increase and decrease of these principles from their normal amount caused illnesses. For example, he states that an increase of mercury produces paralysis, that an increase of salt gives rise to diarrhea, and that gout results from the elimination of the sulfur of the body. Paracelsus maintained that each disease must be antagonized by specific medicines, arcana, and that the preparation of these remedies was the aim of chemistry. In inaugurating this method of combating disease, he employed many chemical preparations, among which were sugar of lead, lead acetate, corrosive sublimate, mercuric chloride, copper vitriol, copper sulfate, lapis infernalis, silver nitrate, and many antimony compounds. In addition, he was the first to use oil of vitriol sweetened by spirit of wine, iron saffron, and iron tinctures, 
and introduced improved methods of preparing various essences and extracts by means of spirit of wine these additions to the medical treasury instigated apothecaries and physicians to engage in the study of chemistry for the preparation of new medicines required a certain familiarity with chemical facts and before the advent of paracelsus the apothecary had been a mere herbalist and storekeeper it may be said therefore that pharmacy began here and that pharmacy as a distinct profession and subject of study was largely found by paracelsus there seems no doubt that paracelsus discovered many facts which became of importance in chemistry he distinguished metals from substances which had been classed with metals his criterion of a metal was ductility and he was therefore led to separate the metals from the half metals a foundation for a classification of the metals which lasted for many generations he obtained the inflammable gas we now call hydrogen by the reaction between iron filings and sulfuric acid though it could not be said to be a discovery in the sense of preparing and identifying the gas the work he did upon the preparation and application of various inorganic and organic compounds led to an extension of the knowledge of chemical preparations the paracelsists who arose as a result of the labors of paracelsus appear to have been largely mystics but included also physicians who were adherents to his school alchemists and charlatans these disciples engaged in a violent contest with the ones faithful to the doctrines of galen and during the sixteenth century the medical world was in a state of agitation as a result of the controversies and polemical writings which resulted this contest was decided if not altogether in favor of paracelsus at least in that of the iatro chemists many of the disciples of paracelsus imitated the roughness the wandering life and the charlatanism of their master these men among whom was thurnizer reproduced the ideas of paracelsus but were without his mental gifts and wrought harm by the careless use of poisonous preparations such acts induced legal action and in some places the prescription of poisonous preparations was prohibited such was the case in paris for example where the parliament put a stop to the use of antimonial preparations in medicine there were such prominent physicians and chemists however as turquet de mayern van menicht kroll and andreas lebau who belonged to the school of paracelsus but regarded his doctrines from a critical standpoint and attempted to extract only the good they contained in these endeavors to separate true scientific facts and doctrines from a mysticism and seeming charlatanism marring the works of paracelsus they enriched both medicine and chemistry to de mayern 1573 to 1655 possessed an excellent knowledge of chemistry for this age and endeavored to introduce the rational application of chemical remedies oswald kroll was the first to recommend the use of volatile salt of amber succinic acid and of sulphate of potash in medicine and adrian van menitsch brought tartar emetic into vogue andreas libau libavius was born at hall and there studied medicine and practiced as a physician he also acted as head of the latin school at rothenburg from fifteen ninety one to sixteen o seven and later became director of the gymnasium at coburg where he died in sixteen sixteen libavius had a wide knowledge of chemistry and made many valuable chemical discoveries from tin he obtained its tetrachloride by distilling it with sublimate and to him belongs the merit of simplifying the method of preparing sulphuric acid and of showing that the acid obtained in many ways from alum sulphate of iron or sulphur and nitric acid covered sulphate of ammonia and investigated the acetates of lead he vigorously combated the defects in the doctrines of paracelsus and did much to indicate the meaningless nature and obscurity of the mystical and sophistic writings of the paracelsists libavius wrote the first textbook on chemistry which put clearly and in order all the most important facts and theories of the science at the date of publication 
1595 this work which was published under the title alchemia e disperis passim optimorum octorum collecta ad bisque ration de experientia quanta portuit esse methodo accurata expleta et in integrum corpus redacta was frequently reprinted and was held in high esteem for a long time his other writings appeared under the title opera omnia medico chimica shortly before his death Labavius possessed a thorough general education and a sound judgment, yet he believed in many of the tenets of alchemy. This was mainly due, however, to the predilection of the period in which he lived, and did not prevent Labavius from serving the interests of chemistry to good purpose. It is important to mention that he made efforts to establish large and well-fitted chemical laboratories. Paracelsus and his followers had turned chemistry into new lines, and the finest talent was enlisted in the ranks of the iatrochemists, or medico-chemists, to whose work Paracelsus had given such impetus. The most distinguished of these iatrochemists was Johann Baptiste van Helmont, a celebrated physician born at Brussels in 1577. At an unusually early age, van Helmont applied himself to the study of philosophy and theology, and to quote from an autobiographical fragment, which he left, Brandt, in 1594, being then seventeen years of age, I finished my courses of philosophy, but upon seeing none admitted to the examinations at Louvain, who were not in a gown and hood, as though the garment made the man, I was struck with the mockery of taking degrees in arts i therefore thought it more profitable seriously and conscientiously to examine myself and then i perceived that i really knew nothing or at least nothing that was worth knowing i had in fact merely to talk and to wrangle and therefore refused the title of master of arts finding that nothing was sound nothing true and unwilling to be declared master of the seven arts when my conscience told me i knew not one the jesuits who taught philosophy at louvain expounded to me the disquisitions and secrets of magic but these were empty and unprofitable conceits and instead of grain i reaped stubble in moral philosophy when i expected to grasp the quintessence of truth the empty and swollen bubble snapped in my hands i then turned my thoughts to medicine and having seriously read galen and hippocrates noted all that seemed certain and incontrovertible but was dismayed upon revising my notes when i found that the pains i had bestowed in the years i had spent were altogether fruitless but i learned at least the emptiness of books and formal discourses and promises of the schools i went abroad and there i found the same sluggishness in study the same blind obedience to the doctrines of their forefathers the same deep-rooted ignorance he therefore concluded that medical knowledge was not to be obtained from the writings of men or from human industry about this time he learned from a chemist the practical operations of the chemical art and devoted himself with great zeal and perseverance to this pursuit in hopes of finding in a chemical laboratory that knowledge which he had in vain sought for from books the medical skill which he by this means acquired he employed in the service of the poor and in addition he enriched chemistry by a great number of valuable observations he died in brussels in 1644 van helmont possessed ready talents read much and by the aid of experiment improved both chemistry and medicine but his vanity led him into empirical pretensions and he had an intense inclination toward the supernatural the result of his mystical studies and application to theology especially to the pious writings of thomas a compass and jean tauler thus did he who possessed powers of observation and perception unapproached before his time by any other observer give expression to fantastic views upon the elements and vigorously defend the transmutation of the base metals into gold he thought that wisdom is to be obtained only by humility and prayer and believed that he had once seen his soul as a bright shining crystal he was convinced that dirty linen packed in a vessel with flour would in time produce mice 
and that a toad's bones applied to an offending part was a certain anodyne he boasted that he possessed a fluid the alkahest which was capable of penetrating into bodies producing an entire separation and transmutation of their component parts no one not even his son saw this wonderful fluid and its possession was a secret van helmont cautiously guarded van helmont looked upon water as the chief constituent of all matter and brought forward many arguments in support of his theory from the animal and vegetable world that water was present in organic bodies he concluded from the fact of invariably procuring it as a product of their combustion he believed that he contributed a strong proof of this by the following experiment he took an earthen vessel of large dimensions and filled it with two hundred pounds of dry earth in which he planted a willow weighing five pounds this was then duly watered with rain and distilled water for five years at the end of which time he pulled up the willow and found that it weighed one hundred and sixty nine pounds and three ounces moreover the earth had decreased two ounces in weight he therefore concluded that one hundred and sixty four pounds of root leaves etc had been produced from water alone and that it was the only nutriment of plants fish he asserted live on water and nevertheless they contain all the peculiar animal substances the latter are therefore produced from water basing his belief on such imaginary proofs as these van helmont was convinced of the transformation of water into earthy matter with respect to his views concerning the four aristotelian elements he denied altogether that fire could be of a material nature but it is uncertain whether he regarded air as an element or not his conception of the elements also differed from those of basil valentine and paracelsus for mercury sulphur and salt were not to be detected in the human body until the time of van helmont little was known concerning gases pliny had spoken of spiritus which possessed properties differing from those of ordinary air and of terrestrial emanations some of which were combustible others unendurable but even basil valentine looked upon all such as common airs with differing impurities paracelsus had observed the evolution of gas when sulphuric acid is poured on iron but this had appealed to him only as a mere expulsion of air van helmont however changed the whole aspect of the question and proved himself an investigator of the first rank when he opened out a new field for chemistry by his researches on gases in his writing the word gas occurs for the first time a word he probably derived from the german gotcht the foam which appears during the process of fermentation and by this generic name he classed all such emanations as could not be brought into the liquid state for example the gas now known as hydrogen carbonic acid and sulfurous acid were distinguished by van helmont from vapors in so far that the latter were condensed to liquids upon cooling while the former were not the views of van helmont on the composition of substances were also far in advance of any of his predecessors and he recognized much more clearly than his contemporaries the unalterability of matter in many instances van helmont further showed that the same substance continued to exist in many of its compounds as for example silver in its salts and demonstrated by quantitative experiment that if one body combines with another and is then precipitated the weight so obtained is equal to that originally taken for example he found that silica when fused to a glass with potash and again precipitated by the addition of an acid lost nothing in weight he had therefore clearly grasped the fundamental idea of the theory of the conservatism of matter in certain cases whenever he came to consider physiological and pathological phenomena van helmont accepted the doctrines of paracelsus only in part as before mentioned he considered that the presence of mercury sulphur and salt in the human body was unproven and held that the acid of the gastric juice brought about digestion but that this produced illnesses if present in excess 
as it could not then be neutralized by the alkali present in the bile as under normal conditions when the mixture took place in the duodenum he therefore declared that diseases resulting from such incomplete neutralization should be treated by the prescription of alkalis or acids according to their nature these views show a distinct advance upon those of paracelsus as van helmont endeavored to decide theoretical questions by the aid of experiments with juices and other secretions of the body thereby laying the first foundation of chemical physiology the footsteps of this iatro chemist were closely followed by his son francis helmont whose paradoxical dissertations are a mass of medical and theological paradoxes scarcely to be paralleled in the history of literature he did a service however by publishing the collective works of his father in sixteen forty eight these works which appeared under the title ordis medicinae vel opera et opuscula omnia were translated into german english and french and passed through three latin editions in germany and the netherlands various other physicians well equipped with chemical and medical knowledge were also active in combating many evils and endeavored to separate true scientific doctrines from mysticism. Among these were Daniel Sennert and Angela Salah. Sennert, who was born at Breslau in 1572, was educated at Wittenberg, where he became professor of medicine, and died in 1637. He wrote Hipponuma Physica, in which he contradicts many of the Aristotelian principles and although he was unable to disentangle himself from many of the false conceptions of the paracelsists he did much to reconcile the adherents of the hippocratic school to the new medicine indicating the efficacy of chemical remedies when properly used and pointing out that the new medicine did not ignore the facts learned empirically under the old system but attempted to interpret them correctly Salat was born Vicenza in 1576 and died in 1637. He had a wide knowledge of chemistry for the period in which he lived and formed correct ideas with regard to the composition and deportment of many chemical compounds. For example, he states that salmiac is composed of carbonate of ammonia and hydrochloric acid and that the nitric acid may be expelled from its salts by means of oil of vitriol the works on chemistry by salah are as follows saccharilogia sixteen thirty seven hydriologia sixteen thirty nine and opera medico chimica sixteen forty seven and sixteen ninety three other influential men of this time were francois de la beau silvius otto tacanius and thomas willis Silvius was born at Hanau in 1614, but his life was mainly spent in Holland. In learning and culture, he far surpassed most of his contemporaries, and he ably filled the chair of medicine in Leiden until his death in 1672. Silvius directed all his efforts to showing that the physiological and pathological processes occurring in the human body were purely of a chemical nature and his views were in the main those of von Helmont, with the spiritualistic element omitted. He did not hesitate to prescribe preparations of antimony and mercury, nitrate of silver, mercuric chloride, and zinc vitriol for internal use in medicine. His opera omnia were published in Paris in 1671. Otto Tachinius, a devoted pupil and follower of Silvius, was born at Hereford in Westphalia and practiced as a physician at Venice in the middle of the 17th century. He was the last iatro chemist of importance who adhered to the doctrines of Silvius and was an investigator of note. He made some valuable contributions to the knowledge of the composition of chemical substances, originating the first pointed definition of the term salt as a compound of an acid and an alkali and studying the proportions by weight in which substances react chemically one of his important observations is that in which he noted the increase in weight which takes place when lead is transformed into its oxide among the writings of tachinius 
the following two english translations are best known clavis to the ancient hippocratical physic of medicine made by manual experience in the very fountains of nature whereby through fire and water in a method unheard of before the occult mysteries of nature and art are unlocked and clearly explained by a compendious way of operation sixteen seventy seven and hippocrates chemicus sixteen seventy seven in sixteen fifty nine appeared the diatribe de fermentation of the english chemist willis who held that fermentation was a decomposition brought about by communication of a vibratory motion to the particles of must and the resulting separation of their loosely combined components this theory was developed by stahl forty years later end of section five recording by lawrence trask mount vernon ohio interface audio dot com Section 6 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Logan Lorenz. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 4. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Chemistry, Chapter 5, The Iatrochemical Period, Part 2. The iatrochemical doctrines contributed much to the general advancement of the science of chemistry, but two mistakes were made by the iatrochemists. They endeavored to explain, on chemical principles, all the changes and processes occurring in the body, an attempt which was futile for the chemistry of that day. And secondly, they set too narrow a limit for chemistry, which was not destined to remain in a subordinate position. Consequently, their many co-chemical ideas were upset after the middle of the seventeenth century, although the tenet of the phlogistic period, the phlogistic hypothesis, which was predominated during most of the eighteenth century, was indicated by many of the iatrochemists. No mention has been made thus far of those distinguished technical chemists, Georgius Agricola, Bernard Palissy, and Johann Glauber, who promoted applied chemistry during the iatrochemical age. This was made necessary since they worked independently of the main iatrochemical current, and in general only fostered chemistry in its applications to industries. Contemporaneous with Paracelsus, but forming a strong contrast to him, was the true investigator, Georgius Agricola, who was born at Glachau near Meissen in 1494 and died while mayor of Chemnitz in 1555. Agricola was a noted physician but devoted himself more particularly to the study of mineralogy and metallurgy, writing little on medical subjects and not troubling himself about the storm over the revolution of Paracelsus. His works, which are indispensable to the history of metallurgy and mineralogy, are characterized by clearness and intelligibility. They are as follows. De re metalli calibri, the twelfth, quibus officia, instrumenta, machen, ac omnia de nic ad metallicam spagnatia non modo lucinatissime discrubuntur sed et per efficis sui loci insertas ac joncti latin germanisc apollinacibo ob oculo ponotur ot glorios tradi non posoint de ortu et causis subterraneum de natura orium quae effluent ex terra de natura falsium de veterbu et nobi metalli bermanu sive de re metallica dialogos fifteen fifty eight and de mensuri et ponribu de precio metallorum et monitis fifteen eighty it was through these writings that the important metallurgical operations first became generally known. Agricola was also among the first to indicate a method by means of which it was possible to estimate approximately the amount of metal in an ore, and to explain intelligibly the manufacture of various preparations of industrial importance. Venusio Berengusi, author of a work on metallurgy entitled pyrotechnica fifteen forty 
in which various technical processes are described, like Agricola, held aloof from the discussion of the iatrochemical questions current in his time. He gave directions for preparing ultramarine, distinguishing it from copper azure. Bernard Palissy busied himself in the domain of ceramic art and succeeded in affixing durable enamels on earthenware vessels, especially on those of faience pottery. His observations on enamels, on the burning in of colors, and on the use of various clays for pottery are embodied in his work La Art des Tarets. His works are clearly written and show that he contributed to the founding of agriculture, chemistry, and mineralogy and that he combated every speculation not based upon observation and experiment. Among these are his Discours admirables de la natura de aux et fontaine, tens naturale que artificialis des mertua des sals et salines des pire des terre du foi et des amor avec plusors autre excellent secrets des choses naturale fifteen eighty and the moyen de devenir riche et la maniere veritable par la que toi les homes de la france pro apprender a multiplier et a commenter les tresors et possessnes sixteen thirty six along with agricola palissy was the chief exponent of experimental chemistry in his time the next name of importance is that of johann rudolf glauber who was born in franken bavaria in sixteen o four and died at amsterdam in sixteen sixty eight and who still shares a somewhat hazy popular fame as the discoverer of glauber salt sodium sulphate this compound which is mentioned in his De Natura Salium, published in 1658, was obtained from the residue left in the preparation of hydrochloric acid, and under the name Salmirbile, was highly prized by physicians. The collected works of Glauber were translated into English and published in a folio volume, containing three parts embodying 26 treatises by Christopher Pack in London in 1689. In these treatises are found clear descriptions of the preparation of many chemical compounds and intelligible explanations in theoretical points of chemistry. Glauber also showed intelligence in questions of national and domestic economy, and on numerous occasions he sought to prove that Germany should work up and improve its own products, and not leave this for other countries to do. He was, however, inoculated with the prejudices of his age, and was addicted to the fantastic extravagances of alchemy in writing he sometimes affected the style of the older alchemists and the following passage from a discussion on concentrating and amending metals by nitre will show how humorously absurd some of his ideas were first a man is to be made of iron having two noses on his head and on his crown a mouth which may be opened and again close shut This if it be to be used for the concentration of metals is to be inserted into another man made of iron or stone that the inward head may only come forth of the outward man but the rest of his body or belly may remain hidden in the belly of the exterior man and to each nose of the head glass receivers are to be applied to receive the vapours ascending from the hot stomach when you use this man you must render him bloody with fire to make him hungry and greedy of food when he grows extremely hungry he is to be fed with a white swan when that food shall be given to this iron man an admirable water will ascend from his fiery stomach into his head and thence by his two noses flow into the appointed receivers a water i say which will be a true and efficacious aqua vitae for this iron man consumeth the whole swan by digesting it and changeth it into a most excellent and profitable food for the king and queen, by which they are corroborated, augmented, and grow. But before the swan yieldeth up her spirit, and singeth her swan-like song, which, being ended, her breath expireth with a strong wind, and leaveth her roasted body for meat for the king, 
but her anima or spirit she consecrateth to the gods that thence may be made a salamander a wholesome medican for men and women in his proserpine or the goddess of riches part three glauber details the fundamental process how to make good gold out of silver with profit and how to separate good gold and silver out of iron tin copper and lead notwithstanding his adherence to mysticism glauber enriched chemistry in an eminent degree by his discoveries in attacking the question of the composition of bodies he commenced by considering the conditions under which salts were produced and the products of their mutual decomposition instead of preparing the chlorides of metals as heretofore by heating the metal with sublimate mercuric chloride he treated the metal directly with hydrochloric acid and concluded that the salt produced was merely a solution of the metal in the acid this was a convincing blow to the time-honored idea that the mercury of the sublimate had entered into the composition of the chlorides obtained moreover glauber taught how to prepare hydrochloric acid from rock salt and oil of vitriol and also fuming nitric acid from saltpeter and white arsenic the preparation of hydrochloric acid or spirit of salt is described in the first section of the second part of the miraculum mundi here also is given the method of obtaining salmirabile the discovery of which first appeared in his de natura salium to the discussion of the spirit of salt glauber adds plainly after the very same manner as we have taught spirit of salt to be prepared so may also be made aqua fortis nitric acid instead of salt take nitre and you will have aqua fortis for a long time afterward the acid thus obtained fuming nitric acid was known as spiritus nitri fumens glabri the combination of acids with metals or alkalis was attributed by glauber to a certain associative tendency which he termed geimenschaft he never employed the term affinity although as mentioned before it was already the property of chemical literature in glauber's works we find a clear description of the preparation of sulphate of ammonia formerly known as sal ammoniacum secretum glauberi and the discovery of nitrate of ammonia nitrum flamens he was also the first to prepare chloride of arsenic and ferric and plumbic chlorides and to him is due a clearer knowledge of the chemistry of antimoniate of potash and other antimony compounds he prepared impure zinc chloride by heating calamine strongly with hydrochloric acid proved that copper sulphate blue vitriol is produced by boiling copper with oil of vitriol and he was the first to mention a case of what is called double decomposition his observations on the latter are of interest to quote from one of his treatises aqua regia which has taken gold into solution kills the salt of tartar potash of the liquor of flints silicate of potash in such a way as to cause it to abandon the silica and in exchange the salt of tartar paralyzes the action of the aqua regia in such a way as to make it let go the gold which it had dissolved it is thus that the silica and gold are both deprived of their solvents the precipitate is composed then at the same time of gold and of silica the weights of which together represent that of the gold and the silica originally taken with glauber and tachinius the period of medical mysticism closes both of them advance chemistry by valuable observations and in many of their chemical ideas and also in point of time they really belong to the next the phlogistic period the iatro chemists had preserved a real science throughout a troublous and philistine period while their often fantastic speculations had caused no inconsiderable increase in the knowledge of chemical preparations however the advance in the knowledge of the composition of substances and in the observation of reactions first became pronounced toward the close of the period in the works of agricola berengucci cisalpino glauber and palissy stress is laid upon accurate description of technical operations and it is from these works that knowledge accrues of the progress made in technical chemistry during the iatrochemical period with regard to the extension of metallurgical knowledge 
it is to be expected that the iatrochemists were more interested in the salts prepared from metals than in the latter themselves as there was always the possibility of chemical preparations proving of value in medicine nevertheless especially in the works of agricola referred to before it is found that a knowledge of the individual metals and of metallurgical operations became extended in the sixteenth century as a result of the publication of what had hitherto been kept secret the methods of obtaining iron became known through the works of agricola and he was the first to describe the production of steel by the puddling process it is interesting to note that steel was looked upon as a very pure iron of the other metals the separation of gold and silver by means of nitric acid and the amalgamation process became generally known tin was employed in the sixteenth century for tinning iron and although zinc and bismuth were often confused with antimony yet a better knowledge of them was acquired and the tutty from zinc ores was employed for making brass one of the earliest treatises on glass manufacture is that by antonio neri entitled l'art vetrerae distinta in libri sete ne quali se scorpono var maraviglosi effetti e sinsignano segreti bellissimi del vetro nel vuoco ed altre cos curiose which was published in florence in sixteen twelve and in latin at amsterdam in sixteen eighty one in this work neri details his extensive experience and it contributed to the diffusion of a knowledge of special ceramic operations in the sixteenth century are found the first dependable observations on the manufacture of ruby glass by means of gold and considerable skill was obtained about sixteen hundred in the production of artificial gems johann baptista porta fifteen thirty eight through sixteen fifteen of naples was the author of a treatise de germarum adulteries in which recipes for preparing imitation precious stones were detailed agricola in his treatise de re metallica gives the first drawing of the interior construction of a glass furnace and in this work as well as in mathesius serepta or Postal, sixteen fifty four are found explicit and interesting directions about the manufacture of glass as carried out in venice germany and bohemia in bohemia the glass industry began to flourish in the sixteenth century the purity of the materials occurring there enabling glass manufacturers to produce the colorless glass for which the bohemian glass houses have long been famous when the venetian glass manufacture fell into decay bohemian glass replaced venetian the first manufacture of glass in england is that of window glass established in the fifteenth century but the product was not satisfactory and in the reign of elizabeth french artists were brought to london and these carried on their trade of making window glass at crushed friars in fifteen fifty seven while flint glass was first manufactured at a glass house at savoy house in the strand mirror glass was manufactured at lambeth by venetian workmen brought over by the duke of buckingham in sixteen seventy glass works were established in france at an early date but it was not until the eighteenth century when workmen were brought from germany that a pure type of french glassware was produced one of the important discoveries of this period was that of cobalt blue by Schurer, a saxon glass blower who obtained it on fusing the cobaltious residue from the manufacture of bismuth with glass this latter became known as zaffir and smolt the efforts of palissy in extending the knowledge of ceramics have been referred to and it only remains to state that johannes porta was engaged in similar work in italy about the same time these savants devoted themselves with self-sacrificing assiduity to the production of glazed and colored faience and laid the foundation of modern art pottery in dyeing a variety of vegetable colors were employed indigo and cochineal were imported from america and the west indies and numerous observations were made on dyeing processes drebbel learned that a solution of tin in aqua regia could be employed for fixing colors on cloth about sixteen thirty and the methods of mordanting with alum and iron solutions were improved 
the art of printing proved for dyeing as well as for other arts its great pioneer and propagator in the middle of the sixteenth century Plictho's art of dyeing was published this treatise gave general instructions for dyeing all kinds of fabrics and laid the foundation for that improvement of this art which soon after followed throughout germany france and england it is interesting to note that the use of indigo was forbidden by the english parliament in the reign of queen elizabeth and that this act remained in full force till the time of charles the second considerable interest was evinced in the distillation of liquors during this period and numerous works upon this subject appeared among these were the following hieronymus sallers liber de arte distillandi de compositis fifteen hundred fifteen twelve and fifteen twenty seven john french's the art of distillation sixteen fifty one and el schultz's distillatoria curiosa sui ratio ducendi licores coloratos per alembucum sixteen seventy four many improvements were made both in distilling apparatus and in the methods of distillation and the distillation of brandy became an industry the word distillation up to the end of the fourteenth century meant the separation of the more light or subtle parts of anything from the more heavy or gross by a process of dropping thus geber and others included the filtration of a liquid as a variety of distillation the latin word distillo applies to a dropping liquid but such employment of the term does not appear after the fourteenth century in chemical works although the older use of distill is still found in ordinary writings especially in poetry and occurs in fielding and shakespeare the process of distillation was classified in various ways for instance according to the source and mode of application of the heat the shape of the alembic or distillatory vessel and the direction compressed on the vapour upward or downward distillatio essensum vel descensum the heat was applied in the form of the direct heat of a fire or the heat conveyed through water or through sand or the direct heat of the sun horta about fifteen eighty five employed concave mirrors to concentrate the sun's rays fairly repeated distillation was often prescribed as the purity of the distillate was thought to be increased each distillation up to the fifth distillate which was termed the quintessence an alcoholic distillate obtained in this way from selected wine was considered to possess great medicinal value during the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries the distillation of fermented alcoholic liquids became subject to state supervision in many european countries in ireland where it has been shown that the distillation of a spirit from fermented barley was practised in eleven seventy up to fifteen fifty six the distillation of spirits was carried on without license or taxation in the reign of henry the eighth distilleries were established in pembroke by irish settlers and it is considered likely that the soldiers of henry the second three hundred years previous brought back with them the knowledge of whisky or uisc bietha the manufacture of aqua vitae from malt appears to have been common in scotland and england in fourteen ninety four and in the middle of the seventeenth century the manufacture of spirits was made a source of revenue by excise duties on the amount manufactured in the tudor and stuart period licenses had been required to use stills the knowledge of chemical compounds especially in the preparation of inorganic compounds showed decided improvements and the beginning of qualitative analysis are sought for in this period in so far that conclusions concerning the presence of one or another constituent were deduced from the appearance and behavior of precipitates and of salts which crystallized out from solutions glauber designed several forms of furnaces and casting vessels which were found to be useful in the preparation and investigation of a number of inorganic substances as a result of the attention paid to the products of vegetable and animal assimilation organic compounds became known in rapidly increasing numbers but the composition of these bodies remained quite undiscernible it is worthy of note that many of the iatrochemists assumed that oil or fat contains a hidden acid 
basing their conclusion on the old observation that fats were acted upon and changed by alkalis. The importation of sugar from Spain, Portugal, Madeira, the West Indian Islands, and Brazil soon made this article better known throughout Europe. Libyphius, in his Alchemia, 1595, mentions Saccharae crystallini quod candi appellant, and he recommends a plan of purifying Madeira sugar by means of albumen, and Angela Sala, in his Sacralogia, advises the use of egg albumen and lime water for this purpose. Milk sugar, occurring in the milk of mammalia, especially in that of the herbivora, was first examined by Fabrizio Bartoletti in 1619. It was termed by him as manna s nitrium sura lactis. It was more closely examined by Testi in 1698. Glauber noticed in 1660 that a granular sugar is contained in honey, raisins, and in the juice of sweet cherries, but he did not point out that it differs from cane sugar. End of section 6